Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm going to present Virtual Cluster, a practical Kubernetes hard multi-tenancy solution. So, uh, multi-tenancy has been uh, required by many Kubernetes users for a long time. From company's perspective, multi-tenancy impacts both the infrastructure cost and the RD efficiency, two things that are very important for company's growth. However, in Kubernetes, uh, that multiple users shared, uh, consume the shared cluster resource in an isolated manner is not easy. This is because in original Kubernetes design, um, the design was focusing on the single tenant use cases, and it, it works great for single tenant use, use cases. But if we want to provide a strong isolation in Kubernetes, most of the core components in Kubernetes control plan and the data plan need enhancements. Uh, some innovation have been done. For example, nowadays Kubernetes support sandbox runtime to provide VM level computer resource isolation and the Kubernetes API server provide namespace API for metadata isolation. But there's still many isolation requirement has not been met. Uh, let us reduce the problem scope a little, bit, a little bit by looking at the control plane only. Is this possible for the native community to support the following? Multiple tenant users run their workloads in a shared resource pool uh, managed by a Kubernetes. Um, but each user can only manage their own workloads and paths. And no matter what they do, other tenants shouldn't get be affected in terms of the security, stability, and manageability. In other words, is this possible to provide a complete control plane isolation in Kubernetes? Another problem is, can this be done natively? Yes, we can build another path layer to encapsulate uh, the Kubernetes cluster to provide complete control plane isolation, but this often introduces non-trivial integration cost for the tenant in order to use the new path. Unfortunately, the na native Kubernetes cannot achieve both. In this talk, we will see how virtual cluster can provide complete control plane isolation natively so that the users doesn't need to pay any integration cost. A little bit, a brief introduction to myself. My name is Fei Guo. I'm a senior staff engineer from Alibaba Cloud. I work in the cloud native application platform team. I'm currently leading a few Kubernetes related projects in the area of serverless Kubernetes, workload management, and the edge compute. Here is the outline of today's talk. First, I will pre present the virtual cluster architecture design. Then I will talk about some technical challenges that we face and how we solve them. I will show some experimental results to show that virtual cluster is a practical solution. And um, then I will also compare virtual cluster with some other solutions and give a quick summary about the project's status. In the end, I will give a short demo. Okay, before I move on, I want to emphasize that this talk solely addresses Kubernetes control plane isolation problems and the data plane isolation techni techniques will not be discussed in this talk. And some of the existing solutions may be referred if they are publicly available. For example, the sandbox container technique. Okay. Before we design our multiple uh, multi tenancy solution, we need to be clear about the threat model that we are tackling. So we assume that the tenant users are not trustworthy. Therefore, exposing cross scope resources is dangerous. Um, uh, there can be security concerns when doing well, uh, when doing this. Of course, um, the tenant users shouldn't be granted permissions to operate on the class scope resource as well. The tenant user may generate harmful usage patterns, for example, the denial of service attacks. But sometimes, those harmful patterns is not generated on purpose. It can be an accident. So, uh, and in the, and, and lastly, the tenant users may serve other users as, as well. So it will make the, it make it even harder to predict the, the tenant users behavior. We assume that the containers are not safe. So overall, if you look at this threat model, 
They are typical in cloud environments, but they may also apply in the internal organization as well. Let's see how upstream Kubernetes can do about this. Namespace is the Kubernetes building API for tenant abstraction, but with a shared control plan, using namespace holding is not enough to provide strong isolation. By sharing the control plan, we have a legacy and a classic noise neighbor problem. For example, if tenant A may have a lot of parts, and if he keep listing his parts, and the tenant B may get a slower response from the API server. Uh, it will become even worse if tenant B runs a more important application compared to tenant A's application. The Kubernetes namespace API does, is not tenant aware, which means a tenant may list all the namespaces in the API server, which can be a problem because sometimes the namespace name can, may contain the sensitive information. The tenant users cannot install class scope resource, which means they cannot install CRDs, webhooks, create class scope roles, etc. This limitation can be a big help mode for many, many Kubernetes use cases. Overall, we need to find a way to enhance the current namespace-based multi-tenancy model in the Kubernetes. I think there are there are many possible solutions to achieve a stronger isolation model in Kubernetes. Uh, but when we design virtual cluster, our primary concerns are in four aspects. The first is compatibility. We need to make, we need to make sure our solution doesn't change any API, existing API. So in order to reduce the tenant users integration cost. The second one is complexity. So we aim to leverage the Kubernetes extensions uh, and don't change any Kubernetes core components. For scalability, we, we target to uh, use cases to support hundreds or even thousands tenants um, to share one Kubernetes cluster. So the solution has to be scaled. The last one is the cost. I think it is okay to have a trade-off between the isolation level and the cost but the cost has to be as small as possible. Now let's look at the, our, our design. Uh, in virtual cluster, each tenant user has a dedicated tenant control plan, which we call the tenant master. A tenant master includes API server, controller manager, and ATCD. The tenant master lifecycle is managed by a tenant operator, which runs in the supermaster. The supermaster is the Kubernetes cluster that manages the actual node resource. The tenant user operates in the tenant master directly, and the, there is a single controller which copies the objects from the tenant master to the supermaster for part provision. The node kubelet watches the supermaster and the create, create the actual container using the sandbox runtime for computer resource isolation. Since the kubelet in the node only connects to the supermaster, we need to find a way for tenant user to access their paths using login or streaming APIs. In order to do this, we add a proxy in each node called VN agent. In, in the tenant master, there is a virtual node object which maps to the physical node that the a tenant pod is actually running on. The virtual node object points to the VN agent so that the VN agent can proxy all the tenant requests to the kubelet. Overall, if you look at this architecture, concept-wise, now the supermaster becomes a part resource provider, and all the tenant part objects management and RBAC control happens in the tenant master. And all the workload controllers, extensions, CRDs, operators are installed in the tenant master directly based on the user's demand. Okay, let's see how this design fits, fits in our criteria. From compatibility perspective, we didn't change any object API and semantics, and we can always support the upstream Kubernetes versions. People may ask the differences between a virtual node object and a virtual kubelet. In virtual 
in virtual cluster, each virtual node has a one-to-one -one mapping to the actual physical node, which means the part affinity and the part anti-affinity semantics are the same as before. But a virtual kubelet does not necessarily represent a physical node. In many cases, it represents a group of nodes, hence the node semantic actually changes. In terms of the comp uh, complex complexity, um, our thinker only sync 12 API objects from the tenant masters for to the supermaster, not all of the tenant objects. And everything is done using the Kubernetes extensions. The complexity is limited. For scalability, we find that one thinker can support hundreds of tenant masters without much performance impact. So we will show some experiment results later. Overall, the solution is scalable. The tenant master cost is always a concern. But if you look at the Kubernetes design, it is actually similar to Linux microkernel. The API server is concise and small, and most of the logic are implemented in the client side. Also, a one Kubernetes master per tenant user is a kind of standard in many cloud service product, such as the AWS EKS and the Arctic Cloud ASK. Overall, I think the cost is acceptable. Well, the benefits of this design are clear. There are no noise neighbors anymore, and one tenant cannot see other tenants' objects at all. If one tenant hits the security vulnerability, and only that tenant is get affected, the tenant user has a full control over the tenant master which provides the best user experience. Next, I'm going to describe some challenges that we face when we implement the virtual cluster. So the biggest challenge we have is actually to provide a virtual cluster view for each tenant. Let me explain it. In virtual cluster, one tenant part has three entities, one part object in tenant master, a part object in supermaster, and a part containers running in nodes created by the kubelet. The thinker doesn't change the part name, but it has to change the part name space in order to avoid potential naming conflict in the supermaster. Basically, we will add a prefix to each namespace in the supermaster. But the problem is that the user can log into the parts that are running in the supermaster but we have to make sure the user recognize his parts running his tenant Kubernetes instead of the supermaster, which means inside the pod, the service, service account, DNS settings, and namespace has to have to represent the tenant config, config, tenant master configurations. It sounds like we have to change the kubelet to achieve this. But in fact, we didn't do that. The thinker does not magic. It manipulates the part template like a mutation webhook for all the environment variables, service account secrets, host lines, and the DNS config so that all the configuration in the tenant master are used. The thinker also ensure the data, the data consistency between the, the tenant master and the supermaster. Basically, the tenant master is the source of the truth for the object spec and the supermaster is the source of the truth for the object status. In the end, the user is not aware of the supermaster at all. Literally, you don't need to change any of your YAML files when using tenant master. It should just work. The thinker is a very powerful controller in virtual cluster. It has a full control over all the masters. But we have to make sure that the thinker doesn't generate too many requests to all the masters for consistency check. We leverage the Kubernetes list and watching mechanism. If you look inside the thinker, they are per object reconciler, which synchronize the object based on the states in the tenant master informal caches and the supermaster informal cache. The idea is that by looking, by comparing the cache states, we can minimize the pressure that a thinker may apply to all the masters, regardless of how many objects need to be synchronized. Okay, next I'm going to pre present some experiment results. We conduct some stress tests. 
uh, in the experiment, we set up a hundred tenant master doing concurrent part creation. The number of created parts is increased from 1K to 10K. And there is only one single controller. In a supermaster, we install a hundred virtual kubelet to simulate a hundred node cluster, which also means that the time spent in the node during part creation is skipped because we use a virtual kubelet. This test may mean uh, evaluate the performance of the control plan. The left figure shows the histogram of part creation time in 10K parts case. So this is a very stressful parallel workload. The part creation time is determined when parts becomes ready in the tenant master. In the baseline case, all parts are created in the tenant master, in the supermaster directly. So from this figure, we can see that uh, when using virtual cluster, uh, about 80% of parts are created within the baseline time, time range. The VC has a longer tails because of the queuing latencies in the sinker. The right figure shows the workload time of creating R parts for different number of parts. The smaller uh, value, the better. Um, from this figure, we can say that we can see that um, the VC doesn't bring uh, significant throughput degradations. In the very stressful 10K pass case, uh, there is about 70% of slowdown, which I think is acceptable. Now let's look at the sinker's cost. The sinker's resource consumption doesn't scale. This is because the supermaster has its own throughput limit. So the sinker cannot drive the load infinitely by burning resources. And the, all the queues in the sinker are back of rate limited queues. The sinker is stateless. Uh, in the 10K parts case, we find that the skate recovery time for the sinker can be, is less than one minute when sinker restarts. In the worst case where sinker really becomes a bottleneck, it can be horizontally scaled easily. In the normal unstressful case, the extra latency added by the sinker is usually less than a few milliseconds. Okay, virtual cluster is not the first trial. There are other solutions that address the Kubernetes control plane isolation problem. I think case 3V uh, is probably the closest one compared to virtual cluster. In K3V, each user has a dedicated control plan, which is a modified K3S API server. Um, to compare in virtual cluster, we didn't change upstream API server. Also in K3V, it follows a per tenant sinker model, which I think is not necessary. Uh, if you look, if you look at the experiment, experiment results I show just now, one sinker can support multiple tenants. There is another project called Actos, which modifies the API server to support the new tenant APIs. I think all the existing plugins have to be changed as a consequence. Also in Actos, it uses a shared control plan for all the, for all the users, then the noise neighbor problem still is, exists. From high level concept wise, the single controller and the virtual kubelet have similarities, but the virtual kubelet uh, use simplified provider interface. So it always has some compatibility issues. Okay, last, last, let me give a quick summary about this project. So virtual cluster is a multi-tenancy working group project. It passed 99% of the Kubernetes conformance tests. The failed one are not supported. For example, there is a one failed test case asked for changing the supermaster subdomain, which is not supported in virtual cluster. Um, virtual cluster has complete unit tests and end-to-end -end test cases, uh, which covered more than 70% of the code. It supports both the cloud and on-prem uh, Kubernetes clusters. The solution has been used in early cloud service product, and it gains more and more interest from the community as well. So feel free to give a try and let us know your thoughts, the comments and the requirements, and we appreciate your help. Okay, next I'm going to give a quick, a short demo for virtual cluster.
In this demo, I'm going to use Kubernetes dashboard. The left dashboard connects to the supermaster. We have already installed one virtual cluster in the supermaster. As you can see, there are a bunch of new namespaces showing up. This namespace is the root namespace. The tenant must parts are installed inside this namespace. We have API server, controller manager, and etcd. The other namespaces are synchronized from the tenant master. The right dashboard connects to the tenant master. And if you look at namespaces, we have a regular Kubernetes namespaces plus a dashboard namespace. The default namespace in the tenant master is empty. So the corresponding namespace in the supermaster It is also empty. Now let's try to create an Nginx service in a tenant master using stable set. As you can see, the pod is actually created in the supermaster. And the pod status is synchronized to the tenant master. Inside, in the tenant master, we have a stable set called my Nginx. But in the supermaster, the stable set is not seen, which means the workload management happens in the tenant master. Now let's try to create another pod to see if we can access the Nginx service in the tenant master. The part is really simple. And yes, it is created. Now let's try to log inside the part. You can see the Nginx service showing up in the Envir the environment variable. And let's see if the tenant DNS works here. The service name is my nginx. The namespace is default. Yes, it works. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to go live and, and answer any of your questions. Thanks everyone. Hello everyone. Yeah, so I think there are some I hope you guys can hear me. Uh, it seems like there is some technical issue. The, the demo video is not showing up in the screen. Um, but I think I upload my whole slides uh, in the same. Thank you. You will now be placed into conference. Ordered. Hello? Oh. 
Is the phone bridge not coming in? Um. Okay, sorry. Uh, I think there are some technical difficulty to play with the demo video. Uh, uh, let me see how can I, I think I need to work with the, the team to make sure um, that the record, the recorded session has a video shows up. Um. Uh, Another thing is, uh, I think in the in the in the session page, I can I, I try to if I can upload the um, the slide deck directly, and the video is embedded in the slide deck. So if you guys have time, you can just try to play it locally by downloading the PPT. Uh, let me see if I can do that after the session. Um, but by now, I can try to answer some of the questions that some guys already asked. Um, I think Mark, uh, Mark just Mark Collard just asked a question. How do you manage the network isolation to actually prevent unwanted traffic? Um, I think that's a great question for uh, all the in, in the multi-tenancy area. Uh, but as I mentioned in the slide, so this slide doesn't cover the uh, the, the data plane isolation. Uh, of course, the network isolation is in part. I think uh, there are parts. They combine both the control plane isolation and, uh, and data plane isolation. Uh, uh, and I do believe there are a lot of ways to try to prevent the unwanted traffic in a multi sensing model, uh, but I didn't include it as a general uh, practice, best practice, because um, the network setups in all the different vendors are so different. Uh, for instance, in some vendors, uh, cloud vendors use VPC to do you know, a network isolation for individual parts. So, in, in real scenario, even the Kubernetes service, the, the upstream Kubernetes service may not work because the Kubi proxy has to, you know, access the node in a uh, network stack. Um, basically, I, I try to make things a little bit simpler. Uh, there are a few things that we can do. First, if we, if we use the VPC model, uh, one way that we have tried internally is that we kind of uh, change the Kubi proxy to inject roles into the each you know part directly instead of in part namespace directly instead of the host uh, network namespace. That's one way you can do. Uh, if you if you don't use the uh, VPC network, um, something that we can do is we can use the upstream you know network policy to let CRA, C CSA, uh, CNA plug in to do the network isolation between the namespaces. The nice thing of a virtual cluster is uh, um, the all the tenant namespaces are synchronized to a supermaster. So exactly there is one-to-one -one mapping between the tenant namespace and the supermaster namespace. So uh, one way that I see some of the VC user has tried is they can come up with their own network policy, uh, create road policies into the uh, tenant master, and the supermaster got a sync the policy, and the CNA plugin can order road policy um, then to uh, to provide network isolation between them spaces as a, as native Kubernetes does. Uh, I, I hope I addressed some of your concerns, but if you did have more concerns, let's chat later in the Slack channel about the network isolation. Um, there is a one question from the Cathy uh, who asked, is virtual cluster used in production by any end users? So currently we have, uh, virtual cluster has been used in uh, some uh, internal uh, the the product, but uh, it has not been exposed to end use yet. So in our model, it's, it's a service product. So there is a small, you know, part layer to encapsulate the virtual cluster. So the the, the the end user doesn't directly access to the virtual cluster. Um, but I don't think there is a um, and technical difficulties to expose the virtual cluster to end user because in theory. Many of the existing service products, Kubernetes service products, does almost the same thing. 
Uh, each tenant has its own tenant, uh, the virtual the tenant master, and uh, that's the interface that we can provide. Um, only additional concept that I, I can think of is the um, the um, privileges. The you probably need to think about what are the rights, you know, service account kind of what are the right permission that each tenant user can operate on the virtual cluster. But for not exactly the security perspective, most likely uh, is for the stability perspective. Uh, you don't want tenants to, to, you know, easily to, to, to make some mistakes and break down this virtual cluster. Um, the tooling wise, um, I see some challenges on the tooling. So, I, so if, uh, as far as I can see now, the biggest challenge is the DNS. Um, the, we have to, in current model, we have to make slightly change. If you look at our uh, GitHub page, I, I, I explain how do we install the tenant to the DNS. Uh, that probably just has a one line change to the upstream uh, core DNS to in order to incorporate, the, the, the incorporate uh, with this model for the, to make sure the tenant DNS works. Um, but uh, but we, we provide a guideline in the GitHub page, and it, should, it, it is very straightforward, and you can easily understand what I'm trying to do in the in the to allow the, the DNS work. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I got a, the latest question is. Um, uh, the question is from Wei. Uh, the question is, I cannot link the multi-tenant project to service concept. So, okay. So, do you have any thoughts on it? So, let me explain a little bit. So, in my opinion, the service in the service concept, the problem, the the whole problem, the the idea is we will have a node which is shared by multiple tenants. So, the the the, the tenant users doesn't have the, uh, the ownership over the node resource. They only have ownership to the part resource. So that's the whole idea of having this, you know, uh, virtual cluster object. Basically, uh, we allow the, you know, a supermaster, which is, which, which, which actually manages the node resource, but the, the, the node resource can be provided by many, many tenants. So in the old model, so in all the multi-cluster models, each tenant will have a, dedicated cluster, but those dedicated clusters also connect to a dedicated pool of nodes. So those nodes can only use by one of the tenants in order to provide a strong isolation. Uh, the problem is the node, node utilization cannot be optimized because if the tenant doesn't use those node resource, the nodes will become just idle. Um, the, the whole purpose of this service model is trying to improve the node uh, utilization, make sure you know the, 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 the hardware resource can be Used by many tenants without any uh, interference or any, you know, uh, isolation concerns between those tenants. So that's why we start <coughs> we start this project. Um, <coughs> and if you look at our model, is um, the node we, we do expose unlike virtual kubernetes. So the node is completely abstracted. Uh, we try to you know maximize the you know the 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 the, the node semantics in the kubernetes. So that's why in our virtual cluster, um, we have a virtual node object which actually maps to the real node. So you can see the uh, everything that you probably about a, uh, node capacity, node name, uh, what are the parts running in the node. So those information are available. So uh, from the tenant's perspective, um, but the but the users just um, can cannot say that I, I'm dominating the node and nobody else can use it uh, at this moment. Uh, node is just a part resource provider. There's no ownership for the node. So node's ownership is below to the supermaster. So that's uh, uh, so that's uh, that's my view to you know mapping this project to your service com concept. Uh, I hope I address your concern. So if you do have more questions about this, so uh, we can check later in the Slack channel. Mm, let me see.
Okay, that's all the questions I have got so far. Um, let's see if I've missed anything. Yeah, I do apologize that the, 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 the demo video is not showing up. Um, yeah, we have some troubles while I do the video, video recording. Uh, I hope we can resolve it uh, later, and uh, uh, especially if we have a replay um, in the YouTube somewhere, and um, that demo will show up. Uh, also, I try to you know see if I can up upload the, the the PowerPoint directly in the project page. Um, all right, it's almost time. Uh, thanks a lot for joining this session, and uh, um, I I'm going to be online on the Slack channel.